Hello, and thank you for watching this presentation where we, we will provide an update on the West Montrose Covered Bridge Rehabilitation Project. We'd like to take the opportunity to acknowledge that this project exists within the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, and Chinatan peoples. We recognize our responsibility to serve as stewards to the land and honor the original caretakers that came before us. My name is Michelle Pinto, the project manager at the region of Waterloo. And today I'm joined by Andrew Lehan from Intuitive, the senior structural engineer on the project, and Steve Taylor from BT Engineering, the consultant project manager. Today we will update you on the results of the detailed timber truss inspection that was done this year. We will also go through the rehabilitation alternatives considered and the updated preferred alternative recommended by the project team. I will briefly introduce the project and provide a summary of the work and public consultation that has been done to date. And then I will turn it over to Andrew and Steve, who will describe the rehabilitation alternatives considered, the valuation methodology that the criteria were assessed with, and the alter that the alternatives were assessed with, and the preferred alternative. After years of detailed structural monitoring and assessment, it has been determined that the West Montrose Bridge requires a structural rehabilitation to ensure safety and preservation of the bridge over the long term. This study follows the municipal class environmental assessment process and is identified as a Schedule C project. In 2014, the region completed a preservation plan for the bridge. In the preservation plan, Recommendations were made regarding the long-term upkeep of the bridge. These recommendations included the general strengthening of the bridge, roof and cladding repairs, and bridge improvements to mitigate risks due to oversized vehicles, fire, flooding, ice, snow, and other environmental forces. To implement these recommendations, the region has retained a strong multidisciplinary consulting team to develop a design that will rehabilitate the Westmont Rose covered bridge and minimize future maintenance requirements, but at the same time, conserve the heritage of the structure. The main goals of this project are to complete a structural rehabilitation to ensure public safety, to preserve the heritage designation of the bridge, and to minimize future maintenance requirements. There are several challenges that need to be considered during the rehabilitation design of the West Montrose Covered Bridge. There are natural forces that need to be contend with, such as wind, flooding, snow, and ice. With climate change, experts in the field foresee increasing wind speeds, higher amounts of precipitation, and increasing frequency and severity of flooding. These all represent additional loads on the bridge that were not anticipated by the original bridge designer. The bridge is also subjected to heavy vehicles from time to time. Broken floor beams due to the overloading of the bridge has been an ongoing issue. The rehabilitation design would need to provide the bridge with sufficient strength to withstand these forces. There is also, also the risk of vandalism. This may include graffiti, wood carving, and fire. The existing roof and cladding of the bridge are deteriorating and are allowing water to leak into the bridge. This accelerates the deterioration of the timber truss. Protection of the timber truss from rain and snow is the primary method of ensuring lon the longevity of the bridge. The rehabilitation will therefore need to ensure the structural members are well protected from the environment. The following background studies are being undertaken to support the environmental assessment, including a natural environment study, a stage one archeological assessment, a heritage impact assessment, a hydraulic assessment, and a geotechnical study. A detailed inspection of the timber trust was undertaken, and I will let Andrew speak to the results of that. Hi, everyone. My name is Andrew Lian. I am a senior engineer at Intuitive. I'm acting as the bridge engineering lead for the bridge rehabilitation. My team joined this project after PCC number two. Upon joining the project, our team conducted two inspections of the bridge to assess its existing condition. The first inspection was conducted from deck level in February 2023. We used scaffolding, ladders, and a scissor lift to gain access to the interior of the bridge. 
The second inspection was conducted from beneath the bridge in June 2023. We used scaffolding on a floating work platform to gain access to the underside of the bridge. The goal of both inspections was to assess the condition of the wood and steel members for the purpose of developing rehabilitation alternatives. We perform non-destructive tests on the wood members in the form of resistance drilling and moisture content readings. For the resistance drilling, a very small diameter needle was mechanically pushed into each member at various locations along the member's length. The purpose was to identify soft locations within the wood where decay may have occurred. The moisture content readings were taken at various locations within each member using a small diameter probe. These readings allowed us to understand whether there was sufficient moisture within a given member for the onset of decay. We also measured the member dimensions and overall dimensions during our two inspections. The original bridge drawings did not include many dimensions, and up to now, no previous rehabilitation drawings had included all the dimensions of the bridge. We collected a significant amount of data from our two inspections. That data was included and interpreted within the field investigation summary report that we published in October. This report is publicly available on the Engage, Engage website for the projects. Several existing members require replacement based on their existing condition. The roof shingles and exterior red cladding require replacement. This is to be expected for a covered bridge as the roof and exterior cladding represent the raincoat for the bridge. They protect the wood trusses from the elements. The floor system also requires replacement. It consists of the nail laminated wood deck, the stringers, which are the equivalent of joists in a house, and the floor beams and needle beams, which are the large transverse beams that are visible on the underside of the bridge. The deck, floor beams, needle beams, and some of the stringers have already been replaced within the bridge's life. Some of the wood truss, mem wood truss members require replacement. Those are the bottom cord members and the end diagonals at the piers. They are decayed at many locations along their lengths. The vertical steel hanger rods require replacement due to corrosion, particularly at their connections. Likewise for the diagonal sway bracing rods that are visible on the outside of the bridge. There are some other members that will require replacement only as necessary. These are the tie beams, squash blocks, vertical posts, and roof sheathing boards and rafters. We will be in better position to assess their existing condition during construction when parts of the bridge are temporarily removed. The overarching goal of the project team is to preserve as much of the existing wood structure as possible. Our intent is only to replace members when warranted by the existing conditions. In October 2021, the region hosted public consultation number one on the Engage WR website. At the time, the region and Doug Dixon and Associates presented a rehabilitation design using steel girders to reinforce the existing timber trusses and to remove the existing steel bailey truss. This is now being referred to, referred to as Alternative A. Following this, the region was asked to look at an all wood option that involved reinforcing the existing timber truss. The region presented this alternative at public consultation number two as alternative B, and I will summarize some of the feedback received on the next slides. We are currently undergoing public consultation number three to present the updated preferred alternative following the detailed timber and truss inspection that was undertaken. So following the last public consultation, in general, there was support for the timber truss reinforcement option presented at public consultation number two. There was support for removal of the interior white cladding, support for physical roadside features to restrict oversized vehicles, and a wood height restriction bar was preferred over steel. Some of the comments we heard from the community are outlined on this slide. We were asked to engage an expert in historic bridge restorations, timber bridge restorations, to determine the level of reinforcement required. We were also asked to look into whether the bridge can be restored to the way it was built in 1881. We were asked to reuse as much of the existing wood as possible, and the community disliked the look of the truss reinforcements and changes to the dimensions of the bridge as a result of alternative B. There were questions about the bridge capacity and and the load limit, both posted and designed, 
and there was re a request to provide traffic calming for horse and buggies on Line 86 during construction. I will now pass it over to Andrew to present the alternatives considered by the project team upon receiving the results of the detailed timber trust inspection and to first go over the elements of the proposed rehabilitation that are common to all alternatives. There are a group of improvements that are common to all the proposed bridge rehab rehabilitation alternatives. The bridge sag will be reduced by temporarily supporting the bridge on jacking beams and refitting the joints to reduce the sag. It may not be possible to fully eliminate the sag, but we can reduce it. The roof shingles and exterior wood cladding will be replaced to afford long-term protection to the wood trusses. They're labeled as numbers two and three respectively. In replacing the exterior cladding, the louver windows will also be reconstructed, which are labeled as number four. The steel bailey trusses that are hidden behind the interior white cladding will be permanently removed. They're labeled as number five. A tarring ship wearing surface will be reinstated to provide suitable traction for bridge users. This wearing surface, labeled as number six, will be better maintained going forward to preclude the potholes that are present today. The pairs of vertical steel hanger rods will also be replaced in kind. They're labeled as number seven. The rafters and tie beams will be replaced as necessary. These members are labeled as numbers eight and nine respectively. We will make the determination to replace them on a board by board basis during construction when we temporarily disassemble parts of the bridge and can better view these members and their connections. The wood curbs are labeled as number 10. They will be replaced with new wood curbs. The existing curbs are not the original curbs. We will also replace any burnt out light bulbs to keep the inside of the bridge illuminated. The floor beams and needle beams will be replaced. They are the large transverse beams labeled as number 12 and 13. The diagonal steel sway bracing rods that are connected to the ends of the needle beams will be replaced too. These thin rods are labeled as number 15. The center pier, which is labeled as number 14, will undergo masonry repairs. The springers will be replaced. They're labeled as number 16. They are the smaller beams running longitudinally that look like joists in a house. The deck will also be replaced, which is labeled as number 17. The truss bottom cords will be replaced too. They're labeled as number 21. There are a series of steel rods and hardware beneath the bridge that will be removed. The steel hanger system for the Bailey trusses will be removed when those trusses are removed. These hangers are labeled as number 18. The steel rods that run parallel to the bridge span will be permanently removed. They're labeled as number 19. These rods were installed in the late 1950s to strengthen the wood bottom cord members. They've loosened quite significantly over time and haven't been functioning for quite some time. The diagonal steel rods, labeled as number 20, are the bottom lateral bracing. The original structure featured these rods, but the rods you see there today are not the original ones. These diagonal rods provide lateral stiffness and strength to the bridge under lateral wind and flood loading. They will be replaced because they are interconnected with the non-functioning longitudinal steel rods that will be removed. Some final points about the group of improvements that are common to all rehabilitation alternatives that we have considered. The bridge deck elevation will not be raised or lowered. It will be kept where it is. Height restrictor bars are proposed to be installed at each end of the bridge to limit the size of the vehicles that can cross the bridge. Doing so will reduce the likelihood of a heavy vehicle ever crossing the bridge. This practice is typical for covered bridge rehabilitation. A fire retardant will be applied to all the wood members to reduce the chance of the bridge suffering significant fire damage. And finally, the bridge will remain posted for a three ton vehicular live load. That means you will continue to be able to cross the bridge in your cars, SUVs, horse and buggies, and most pickup trucks. The odd, very heavy pickup truck, like say a Ford F-350, will be too heavy to cross, 
but that vehicle is not representative of the vehicles that typically cross the bridge on a given day. Larger vehicles, like moving trucks, school buses, and transport trucks, will not be permitted to cross the bridge by virtue of their weight. These vehicles will continue to have to use the Regional Road 86 bridge to the east, as they do today. Our project team evaluated a series of rehabilitation alternatives. Alternatives A and B were developed previously by others. We introduced a family of four alternatives called Alternative C. Each of alternatives A, B, and C were evaluated using the multi-attribute trade-off system that will be described shortly. I'm going to first introduce each of the alternatives to you. Alternative A was developed several years ago. It was presented at PCC number one in October 2021. The primary features of this alternative are replacing the existing steel Bailey trusses with new steel box girders and replacing the existing sawn wood floor beams with new steel floor beams. The Bailey trusses were installed within the bridge in the mid 1960s. Bailey trusses were abundant in the decades following the Second World War. At that time, they were a convenient means of strengthening the original wood trusses. The steel box girders are the modern day analog of the Bailey trusses. The box girders proposed for Alternative A were proportioning to support 15 tons of life load. In simple terms, Alternative A represents a continuation of the bridge's current configuration, wherein the primary load carrying material is steel, not wood. The bridge would look very similar to its existing state if Alternative A were implemented. The interior white cladding would be replaced in cut. This interior cladding would have to be a bit wider because the box girders would be wider than the existing Bailey trusses. The road width would be slightly narrower as a result. Alternative B was developed by others after PCC number one in response to public objection against the new steel box girders proposed for Alternative A. It was presented at PCC number two in June 2022. The primary feature of this alternative is strengthening the existing wood trusses by bonding fiber reinforced polymer strips to the underside of the bottom cord members. Additional reinforcement of the truss diagonals was also proposed in the form of fastening new wood elements to the existing wood members. Other proposed features include permanent removal of the steel bailey trusses and the interior white cladding, an installation of glue lamb deck panels and a timber guide rail. Alternative B was ultimately found to not be feasible because of the deteriorating condition of the wood bottom cord members identified during the bridge inspections. These bottom cords are too deteriorated to justify bonding on new reinforcement. When we came onto the project, we wanted to investigate the possibility of rehabilitating the bridge by removing the steel bailey trusses and strengthening the existing wood trusses using new wood elements. That outcome would revert the bridge back to its original form, that is, a bridge where the primary load carrying material is wood. What we came up with was a family of related alternatives, globally referred to as Alternative C. Our assignment was to investigate the levels of intervention required for the bridge to achieve five and 10 ton load limits. In working through that, uh, that original exercise, we realized that it would be better to examine the level of intervention required for each additional increment of live load. So we performed a structural evaluation of the bridge for live loads ranging from three tons to 12 tons on a one ton incremental basis. In doing so, we were able to determine the live load, th live load thresholds beyond which further intervention would be required. We used this exercise to develop alternative C1 to C4. Alternative C1 was designed for a 12 ton live load. Alternative C2 was designed for a 10 ton live load. And alternative C3 and C4 were designed for eight and six ton live loads respectively. In summary, our team looked at six alternatives. Alternative A was a modern day continuation of the existing configuration of the bridge by replacing the steel bailey trusses with new steel box girders. Alternative B sought to strengthen the existing wood trusses with modern fiber reinforced polymer materials, but this alternative was ultimately found to not be feasible because of the poor condition of the existing bottom cord members. And finally, Alternative C sought to strengthen the existing wood trusses using sawn wood elements. Thank you, Andrew. 
I uh, for describing the alternatives. My name is Steve Taylor and my role is to lead the environmental assessment tasks and my background includes leading numerous complex environmental assessment studies and documenting the public consultation and decision making process. The environmental assessment is actually the documentation of the decision making process, which I'll describe in the next slides. The process which has been used for this EA is generally described uh, on this slide. It's the multi attribute trade off MAT process, which is a detailed methodology that allows diverse teams to rank alternatives based on the performance of the alternatives and judging the importance of criteria or issues involved. It's been used for complex high profile projects where there are many criteria and or a large number of alternatives. For this project, we've identified four factor groups to compare the alternatives that Andrew described. Within each factor group, sub factors were identified by subject area experts to distinguish the performance of the alternatives were being compared. Uh, using these measures, the evaluators are given weight to the importance of each sub factor factor group. These weights are used are used to prioritize the scores for each criteria criterion. Uh, cultural heritage was judged as the factor group with the largest importance as shown on this slide with the blue pie in the graphic. Uh, scores were then determined by mathematical relationships defined by each subject area expert. Alternatives score higher if they have high performance and perform well for most for the most important sub factors. This slide presents the scores of each alternative and it's color coded to reflect which factor groups added score to each option. Again, the blue height in the bar reflects cultural heritage. Alternative C2 scored the highest of the group and was considered the best balanced solution. This alternative, C2, respects the heritage designation, minimizes the changes to the heritage features of the existing truss bridge, provides certainty in the structural load carrying strength of the bridge, and provides good durability to extend the service life of the bridge. As part of the evaluation methodology, we've also undertaken sensitivity tests, the weights provided by the evaluation team. This process allows us to consider the range of weights in addition to the average perspective of the entire group. It allows us to reflect the diversity of the people included in the evaluation. To do so, it considered a series of tests considering the highest and lowest weight for each factor group given by any individual. There are alternatives that perform better for structural or for cultural heritage, but not for both. Alternative C2 is the alternative that performs well for all the criteria and therefore was measured as the best balanced solution. It did well for all factor sub factors, and that's why it rose to the top of the alternatives considered. That ranking was then endorsed by the entire group of the evaluation team and reflects a technical recommendation of the evaluation team. Thanks, Steve. As noted, the recommended rehabilitation alternative as determined by the MATS evaluation is indeed alternative C2. This alternative is predicated on repairing and strengthening the existing wood trusses to achieve a 10 ton design live load strength with the steel bailey trusses being permanently removed. In doing so, the bridge will revert back to its original configuration where wood was the primary load carrying material. To achieve the alternative C2 design, several existing members will have to be repaired, strengthened or replaced. The entire floor system will require replacement. That is the deck, stringers, floor beams, and needle beams. The deck will be repaired in kind, or replaced in kind, with a nail laminated wood deck comprised of dimensional lumber. The stringers will be replaced in kind using sawn wood beams. The existing floor beams and needle beams will have, uh, have a 12 inch by 12 inch cross section. Our initial development of alternative C2 suggested that we needed to switch to glued laminated timber, or glue line for short, to achieve the requisite strength using the cross the existing cross section size. In speaking with the bridge keepers, we came to understand that there is strong community preference to not using glue lamb as a replacement material. Instead, the preference is to use members uh, of sawn wood with larger cross sections as needed, 
so that we can keep the bridge entirely made of sawn wood. Our team was able to source some larger sawn timbers. So the floor beams and needle beams have been replaced using 16 inch by 16 inch sawn timbers. We do not believe the larger 16 by 16 cross section will look appreciably different than the existing 12 by 12 cross section when viewed from the shoreline. The truss bottom cord members require replacement as well due to their deteriorated condition. They will be replaced using sawn timber members. And finally, the steel rods comprising the diagonal cross bracing beneath the bridge will also be replaced. This cross bracing is necessary to resist lateral loads due to wind and flood load. Inside the bridge, the wood trusses will be repaired and strengthened. The end diagonals at the piers will be replaced due to their deteriorated condition. The end diagonals at the abutments will be strengthened by fastening new sawn wood elements to them. Lateral bracing will be added overhead in the same plane as the tie beams. This bracing will stabilize the top cords against buckling. It will also stiffen the wood trusses against becoming out of plumb. At present, the trusses are visibly leaning to the east. This new bracing will help prevent that. At deck level, new wood curves and new wood guide rails will be installed. These additions will help to protect the trusses from direct vehicular impacts. The existing wood trusses are of rare geometry. They feature both an upper and lower top cord. These members will be strengthened by fastening them together. They are presently separated by hardwood squash blocks at discrete locations. The squash blocks will be removed and replaced by a continuous sawn wood member that will enable the joining of the upper and lower top cords. The interior white cladding will largely be removed. The intent is to expose the existing wood trusses so that their inherent heritage value can be viewed. Furthermore, there is currently a group of raccoons using the space behind the interior white cladding. They've left behind considerable quantities of feces that have contributed to the decay of the existing bottom cord members. By eliminating the cladding, the durability of the bottom cords will be improved. A short segment of cladding will be kept at each end of the bridge. These segments will protect the wood trusses at their ends from driving snow and rain. This practice has commonly been undertaken for other wood covered bridges, with these short segments of cladding often referred to as shelter panels. A final note that there are other rehabilitation tasks that will be undertaken for alternative C2. They were previously described as being common to all alternatives. Here are a few of them of note. The exterior red cladding and roof shingles will be replaced to protect the wood trusses. The, ex the new exterior clad will be painted red again to match the color of the existing cladding. The bridge sag will be reduced. And finally, a fire retardant will be applied to protect all wood members from fire damage. I'm just going to describe <clears throat> some refinements that are under consideration. So this slide illustrates that the design team is looking at alternatives to provide height restrictors to protect the bridge from damage from oversized vehicles. As part of the EA process, we're looking for comments from stakeholders on these options. The slide shows options that, and each is proposed to currently restrict the height to three meters. This next slide illustrates the preliminary location of the height restrictors. Based on feedback we've heard to date, the locations are proposed to be pulled back as far from the bridge as possible to avoid interference with photos being taken of the bridge. Again, the locations are shown for the public and community to comment on. We are also asking the public to provide input on restricting cars from using the bridge through the use of signage. There are benefits from restricting motorized vehicles from the bridge, including improved long-term durability of the bridge. Horse and buggies, pedestrians and cyclists would still be permitted across the bridge. This would not change the recommended preferred alternative C2 to rehabilitate the bridge to a 10 ton load limit. Please complete the engaged survey to let us know what your preference is. So we are currently undertaking the third round of public consultation to ask the public for comments and feedback on the preferred alternative. 
After we collect feedback, we will finalize the preferred alternative for recommendation to Regional Council early next year. Following Regional Council approval of the preferred rehabilitation concept, we will file the environmental study report for a 30 day review period, and then we will proceed to detailed design with construction plan to begin in 2025. Please subscribe to our Engage WR page for future project updates. An in-person public open house is planned on November 22nd, 2023 from 6.30 p.m. to 9 p.m. at the West Montrose United Church. The, sur the survey will be open on Engage until December 13th. Your comments are encouraged and welcome, and we will be collecting all of them from the pro for the project team to review and answer. Thank you, to listen, thank you for listening to this presentation, and we look forward to he hearing your feedback on this project. Hello, and thank you for watching this presentation.